the prophecy of Ze Zephaniah ends with such beautiful words. Rejoice and exalt. You will no longer fear. God will create calm with God's love. God will rejoice over you, singing, I will deliver the lame. I will deliver the outcast. I will change their shame into praise and fame. Such beautiful, touching words. The rest of Zephaniah, eh, not so much. From its first words at the beginning until these last six verses, the central message of Zephaniah is that the wrath of God will result in the total destruction of the entire earth. But at least the wrath of God that results in the total dis destruction of the entire earth will be worth it because it's followed by the establishment of a new world order that guarantees safety, security, and prosperity. Nice. But only for the faithful people of God. For the rest, total destruction of the entire earth. South African scholar Dr. Umbue Sango is, a, is an expert on Zephaniah and wrote, in the wrote the commentary for the Africana Bible. She said very clearly, Zephaniah presents a view of God that is dangerously exclusive and nationalistic. The lack of interest for the well-being of foreign peoples is striking. Zephaniah is the stereotypical, classic, vengeful God of the Old Testament. And to make Zephaniah palatable enough to read in church, even if Bruce did it so beautifully, outside of those who love the image of a vengeful God, we have to rely on this happily ever after ending, which, after you put it in context, <laughs> isn't quite so happy for everyone. And so, uh, with, a with a lot of the Bible, we just sort of say, well, does that mean we should just ignore it? And maybe. But let's try to unpack and understand it first. So according to Dr. Judith Sanderson, who wrote about Ze Zephaniah in the Women's Bible Commentary, many of the prophets, like Micah and Amos and Jeremiah, express solidarity with people who were humble and lowly, the poor and oppressed. Now, they weren't humble, I mean, excuse me, they weren't widows, but they knew widows, okay? These prophets spoke of and spoke to the poor because they shared a similar social standing. But in contrast, scholarship suggests Zephaniah was a member of the upper class and may have been speaking to and of the people with whom he shared his social standing. And if so, he's, if he's talking to his fellow upper class neighbors, his words might have indeed been appropriate for his audience. Throughout his prophecy, Zephaniah strongly emphasizes the sin of arrogance. And throughout the Bible, God's wrath is often in response to arrogance. Dr. Sanderson therefore suggests that God's response, not necessarily the wrath, but God's intolerance of arrogance is fitting to his audience. When we interpret it, however, sadly, arrogance is often misunderstood and translated as pride. Pride and arrogance are two different things. She said many people in a dominant position in society need to hear a call from God to give up their arrogance. They need to give up their illusion of so-called self-sufficiency. They need to learn the kind of humility that values others as much as self, and that will rely on God rather than self for guidance and help. However, that kind of language is often inappropriate to the experiences of women, and people of color, and people with physical disabilities, and people with mental health challenges, LGBTQ people, the 
the list goes on. Rather than a denunciation of pride, some people need to hear a call from God encouraging pride that will value the self as much as others and that will rely on God for empowerment. So you got that? Some people need more pride, while other people's pride is really arrogance, and God is intolerant of arrogance. When Mary sang the Magnificat, that was kind of her message too. With the impending birth of her child, she praised God for toppling the powerful from their thrones and lifting the humble high. Dr. Umboyes Congo says something similar, relating that the Bible in southern Africa has been used both as a book of oppression and a book of liberation. And both themes, she said, run through Zephaniah. As a book of oppression, for example, the Bible was used as a justification for Europeans to colonize Africa. As a book of liberation, the Bible serves as a guide in a search for an ethnically diverse post-colonial Southern Africa. That same dynamic was and is still true in the U.S. as well. Remember, Zephaniah's message is dangerously exclusive and nationalistic. It plays right into the hands of Christian nationalists in our country who ultimately want a return to whites only power with a different name, and women without power over their choices, and LGBTQ people locked in a closet. Christian nationalists today want the Bible taught in school, but not the teachings of Jesus. The Ten Commandments but not the Beatitudes. And we cannot allow them to claim the Bible as their property. It has been used for oppression. Certain texts have been used to terrorize, but it is indeed a story of liberation that guides us to free one another. And one small step is to ensure that we accurately translate biblical denunciations of pride that's really God's intolerance for arrogance, thereby leaving room for a pride that men often take for granted, but which many others, especially women, were not taught as children. And so, for people who have been empowered by God, rejoice and exalt, you no longer need fear evil. God will create calm with God's love. God will rejoice with you, over, singing over you, I will deliver the lame, I will deliver the outcast, I will change their shame into praise and fame. Beautiful. But alas, yes, the problem still remains, that whole promise of the dis total destruction of the entire earth by the wrath of God except for the privileged few, not quite happily ever after. And nothing is or will be until everyone born has a place at the table. Not until everyone born has clean water and bread, a shelter, a safe place for growing. For everyone born, a star overhead. And so, what do we do with Zephaniah and, and other readings like it? Do we just ignore them? Well, first, let's continue our search for understanding. And therefore, let's look at our other text for today. You may recall last week that Zechariah was the name of John the Baptist's father, not to be confused with today's Zephaniah. But if you listen to John, he sounds very much in the tradition of prophetic wrath, too. In the verses right before our reading today, he called the people who came to be baptized by him children of snakes or broods of vipers. He asks, who warned you to escape the angry judgment that is coming soon? He told people, whoever doesn't produce good fruit will be chopped down with an axe and thrown into the fire. So much for joy Sunday. 
And yet people still flooded to him, coming from the cities into the wilderness. And maybe it was for the entertainment, or maybe they sincerely wanted to change their lives. You note in our reading today, when people had been baptized, afterward they asked, what should we do now? They didn't say, woohoo, I got my golden ticket to heaven. They didn't say, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. They sincerely asked, okay, now what? They expected baptism to change their lives. And what joy there is in knowing we are not trapped by past mistakes or choices that ended in failure. We can turn our lives around. Amen? When the crowds ask, what should we do now? John gave an answer. In fact, a concrete, I can do that answer. To everyone he said, if you have two coats, give one to someone in need. I can do that. And what joy for the one who gives. What absolute exaltation for the one who receives. How sad for anyone who won't. Ah, but they too can change their lives. Then the soldier stepped up and asked, what should we do? And John answered very concretely, don't cheat or harass anyone and be satisfied with your pay. Now, this isn't a slogan for low-wage workers. This isn't the proclamation of a CEO making a hundred or a thousand times minimum wage. The Bible says, be satisfied with your pay. Now, John was specifically addressing soldiers from the occupying force stationed in their homeland. Be satisfied with your pay doesn't mean, means don't take what isn't yours. And you have to think the soldiers didn't have a lot of choices either. I mean, I doubt Rome had a strategy for recruiting other than rounding up people and forcing them to serve the empire. In fact, they often used conquered people to conquer and subdue more. But John had a specific, simple message to soldiers who wish to change their lives. Don't exploit the citizens. Then the tax collector stepped up. What should we do? And John said, take what's legitimately yours and no more. Many were raping the poor. Others were just trying to make a living too. They were just as subject to the whims and brutality of Rome as anyone, but they didn't have to make it worse by overcharging people trying to survive. So interestingly, all three of John's concrete answers are economic messages. It seems that the baptism of John leading to repentance of sin is to simply treat each other right. Again, it's not a golden ticket to heaven or a get-out-of-hell card. John the Baptist's message starts out very harshly, but it's simple. It's ultimately a message that repairs the breach of arrogance with equity to the soldiers and tax collectors. Treat others fairly and with dignity, even if you work for the empire. To everyone, bear fruit worthy of your baptism. If you have it, clothe the naked, feed the hungry. Give voice to the silenced and silence the powerful. Give pride to the oppressed and remove the control of the arrogant. And on that one point, Zephaniah is right. He calls out the arrogant. Though I'm not certain they still deserve the wrath of God resulting in the total destruction of the entire earth, although they too deserve the opportunity to make it right by changing their lives. But as for the rest of Zephaniah's message, don't just ignore it. Reject it. Reject it. And all the false religion today of Christian nationalists and their xenophobic white power, immigrant-hating masquerade of Christianity. What a sad, sad vision they have. Reject it. 
and rather hold up a vision of joy and exaltation of a home for everyone born, wherever they have been born. That's true joy in heaven on earth. Today, I ask you, step up and say, hey, John, what should we do? And whatever he says to each of us individually, remember, he talked to people not as a global all, but what were their needs. As he talks to each of us individually, I'm sure he has a specific and simple message to which we can answer, I can do that. Amen.